So, uh, former Prime Minister, yes. um, what's the view like from the back benches after <laughs> nine years as Prime Minister? It's a long way back, actually, there. Um, oh, look, I'm enjoying it. I'm, um, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my time when I was there. It was a real privilege to lead New Zealand and to lead the party. Uh, but I'm in a very happy space, you know, I don't sort of, I'm in an unusual space probably for a former leader. Normally they're either a little grisly that they got kicked out or lost an election or something, but because I didn't either, um, I kind of feel like, you know, a decade as the national leader and eight years as Prime Minister, about the right time. Um, I think the transition's been amazingly smooth and I've got 100% confidence in Bill. And I think you can see those numbers just, you know, rolling out of me and into Bill and, and into the party. So. Um, I feel like the transition's gone well. So I don't wake up in the morning with any regrets. I don't think, oh gosh, I wish I was there. But equally, I don't um, wake up and think, oh, I wish I hadn't been there. I'm, I'm just really happy with what I've done. And I'm you know, starting to look forward to what I'm going to do next. In saying that, do you feel like you left any unfinished business? Um, there's always unfinished business, realistically. I mean, you can pick individual things, you know, getting TPP over the line or the Kermadex or you know, whatever it might be. Um, but the truth is that politics is always retail, and it's really about the things that matter to people. It's, you know, it's the economy and law and order, health, education. And there are always improvements that you can make in those places. And one of the reasons why I think change is not a bad thing, actually, you know, when you've got a new leader like we have with Bill coming in, is they just take a slightly fresh set of eyes to it, you know, so it's continuity. And everyone has enormous confidence in him because they've seen him over the last decade with me, but also they know it's just going to be that little bit different. So yeah, I, I think it's it's a destination, um, it's a journey, not a destination. You're never gonna, never, it's never going to be job done and everything. Superannuation is obviously yep. one issue that Mr English has come in and taken quite a different approach. You obviously had your pledge that you had made, yep. but is this the right time for New Zealand to be looking forward and, and actually for the government to be doing something about it? Well, I back him. Um, you know, he's a thoughtful guy. Um, they will have gone and done all the numbers and the work on it. It's 20 years out into the future, so it's a long way away. And um, I wasn't surprised. Um, I wasn't surprised by the, the steps that they took, and I just have enormous faith in Bill and Stephen as the finance team to, you know, to be balancing off the different competing objectives. I mean, it was right for me when I was there, um, and even Bill wasn't proposing to raise it for 20 years, so it's not exactly like you know it's just changing dramatically overnight. But um, probably it's sensible, I think, to to um, give people an indication of you know, later on down the track that it's going to go up. Did you take any implied criticism from his move so quickly to address superannuation? No, I think you know you have to do some things that are a little bit different. I mean, so as I said, you need continuity, but you need change. And if everything's just exactly the same, then I think people go, well, what was the change all about? Um, and Bill's always going to be a bit different from me, and that's actually a really positive thing because I kind of think, to me, it's like you know. Uh, to give you a kind of golf analogy, you know, we're all playing the same game, but we play it with a slightly different style, a slightly different swing, and that's what politics is like. You know, the you know he's 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 the prime minister of a national league government, and I was too, but it's always going to be a little bit different. Um, and we've happily cohabitated with quite different views on lots of things over the years, particularly probably in social areas more than economically. We've been you know, very much joined at the hip, um, but but there's a space for all of that in, in an MMP environment, in the MMP parliament. Is there anything you wish you'd handled better that you think, I really didn't quite get that right, I, I wish I'd done something a different way? Um, yeah, there are always things you could have done better. I, look, I think with the Kermadex, we just, we were just so convinced that everyone would think it was a good idea. We never ever thought that, you know, Māori would somehow think it was a bad idea. and. They'd spent so much of the time that I was Prime Minister sort of lobbying me for conservation and for preservation of, of the environment that when we did such a enormous sort of step that, that they objected. And, um, yeah, that surprised me. I think... Uh, look, I think with the flag... Um, to me, the flag, the flag, the actual, the actual flag itself is, you know, is not the biggest issue. So it's what the flag represents, and that is, in my time as prime minister, my main objective was trying to make New Zealand more successful, and more confident, and I think that suits my personality, and I think it suited the style of government that I led, and I personally believe that that changing the flag was just another step along that line. So, you know, when people went back and said, oh, if we'd only had some experts designing a flag, I think that was a red herring, because everyone had the chance to design one. Who wouldn't want to have their name on the new flag? Um, 
but I kind of wish we had. I, again, you know, like sometimes in politics things surprise you, and it's kind of crazy that it does, because you really think about it when we live and breathe the stuff. So it's not actually a criticism of Labour and the Greens, it's just that it was their policy. And I'd sort of tried to do it in a neutral way down at you know, Vic University, so yeah, it was a little bit disappointing, but, but um, oh, there were a lot of things we got right. Why do you think it didn't get across the line? You personally really put your political stock onto that and, and pushed it. Did you think that that would be enough to, to maybe persuade people who needed persuading? I think, put it this way, we did, we, if you think about the voting, the likely voting patterns, national voters were always more likely to be hesitant than Labour and Greens voters. And the way the numbers turned out, national voters overwhelmingly voted to vote to change. And what that shows you is that they backed me. They just said, oh, he's my Prime Minister, and if he thinks it's a good idea, I'll close my eyes and do it. Um, but I needed, there were always going to be some people who just found the step, the step too far for whatever reason, the history, the, you know, the RSA position, whatever it might be. And so in a lot of ways, I, um, I really needed Labour and the Greens to want it. And I think if they had wanted it, we would have got there, but, you know, I understand it, you know, I understand you can make political capital. The funny thing was, of course, it never really worked because, um, you know, the, the, the first poll after we lost the, the, the referendum, I went up, the National went up, so it was funny, actually. Do you think people saw it as quite a disconnected issue that they didn't totally. necessarily see it as... Some of our strongest supporters didn't vote to change and people who don't terribly normally like me, like me would never vote in National or voted to change. What will you do with the Prime Minister's annuity that you get, the $51,000 a year? Um, I don't know really. I'm going to take it. Um, I'm not taking anything else. I've kind of, I never have really taken my cars and all those different things. Um, look, inevitably, um, I'll, I'll yeah, either have some expenses or I'll make some donations and things over time, but I don't have a set plan for it at the moment. Do you think Prime Ministers and Governors General and other dignitaries should continue to get these payments into the future once their, their term has finished? Um, I don't say this purely as a matter of self-interest, but I think there's actually an argument that we're not that generous. So if you look around the world, um, John Howard has an office, he has staff, um, he still to this day has a driver and some sort of protection. Um, that's true in Canada, it's actually true everywhere else. Um, now, you know, it's obviously going to be different in a smaller country somewhere, but in a place like New Zealand, which is, you know, a first world developed economy, um, one of the issues is, you know, just, it's different for Helen Clark because she's gone off to the UN and she's got a whole infrastructure around her. But I'm now in a position where I don't have, yeah, I don't have infrastructure, I'm going to have even less as of tomorrow. And that's okay, except, you know, I am going to have to hire someone because there's just so many people that want to email me or talk to me or make appointments or whatever it might be. So, um, look, there'll always be some people who say, ah, oh, these guys don't deserve anything. But, but the truth is that, you know, if you came into politics for the money, you're really coming in for the wrong reasons. And I don't think many politicians do. What are your plans now? Um, this year is going to be reasonably quiet-ish. You know, it's probably not what Rona would say right at the moment. She's so busy and she thought it would be but. The reality is that yeah, I'll do some international speeches, I'm doing a few bits and pieces, um, but I'm going to go on a few boards and what I've been doing so far is just sitting down with everyone that wants to talk to me and there, there's been both internationally and locally and at some point I'm going to distill that down but I'm probably not going to start on any board until at least the end of this year. Um, I think I've kind of distilled in my own mind um, a couple that I, I think are starting to shape up as well and likely to go. Um, I don't want to overcommit myself because otherwise it's a change of location or a change of lifestyle. And my kind of perfect view in my own mind, and it might prove to be different later on, is a patchwork of slightly different things where I'll, I'll do some different stuff. Then. And your um, news reports about Dr. Haruhisha. Oh, yeah, Hunter. Hunter. Yeah, so what's yep. happening with that? Are you, well, are you I'm working with him for him? Yeah, yeah. So I'm his patron for a couple of his charities. I'm going to Cambodia actually for him in three weeks' time. He's got a huge amount of um, interest over there. You know, he's got an orphanage and a hospital and schools and lots of things he does. So he's very philanthropic. And he does things all around the world. And it kind of works for both parties. You know, it suits him to have someone that is, you know, 
bit more high profile and respected on the world stage and it suits me because some of the things he's doing, he's very interested in golf. He's the biggest proponent in the world of blind and disabled golf. So he's been the guy trying to get blind and disabled golf into the, um, into the Paralympics and he's a big funder of the Invictus Games for instance. So I went to Australia for him for the, you know, for the both to Perth and Adelaide for the men's and women's, not quite the Australian Open but it's a PGA events. And um, so, you know, for both parties it was great for me. I went and watched some great players play golf and played in the Pro-Am for him. You know, it's useful having someone there. Are you in a position where you would um, name the boards uh, or the companies that you have distilled down in terms of what you're looking at? I can't today, um, simply because we're still going through a process and, and anyway they, they need to, um, they're working with their own board members and things. But um, the, the, the blue chip, obviously, um, I'm going to be really careful about what I do you know, for, for a variety of different reasons. I mean, my reputation is you know, the, the only thing anyone really has. And um, because I don't need the money and I don't need the, you know, I don't sort of need the role per se, um, I'm in that sort of really lucky position that I can pick and choose what I want. And because I've had lots of offers, you know, I can really sort of distill them down. And, um, but look, they're, they're, they're great companies. One of the questions I get asked the most is, why did John Key really leave? leave? leave. I know. Yeah, I had Anything to, else I had you to want shatter to share? everyone's <laughs> illusion. I know. I'm sure Nikki Hagel will have a view on that tonight. But no, look, there is no, there is no scandals. I mean, I think I often say to people, well, look, what, what's unusual about it is that no one does it. No, no. It's a, it was a really hardcore. I mean, I really sat there for about a year thinking long and hard. And sometimes I'd say, yep, no, I'm definitely going to do it. And then two weeks later, I think, mm, maybe I shouldn't do this. And I could have only done it if Nationals' numbers were high, my numbers were high, and it didn't look like I was, you know, a hospital passed the bill. But I kind of felt, you know, a decade as the leader was about right. And I'd done everything. I'd been everywhere from the Security Council to every APEC you can imagine. And I just sort of felt, oh, I don't know whether it's just going to look like I'm sort of hanging on because I want the job rather than I feel like I can, you know, make a difference now. And so... There'd been lots and lots of rumours early on because I'd said to people, you know, if I was Prime Minister, probably three terms would be enough. So I'm not surprised. I, I, in a way, people probably shouldn't be as surprised as they were. And, I mean, purely from my point of view, as I said to you earlier, I'm amazingly contented. And so for the rest of my life, I'm always going to have that feeling of being like, no one shoved me out. I had a great time when I was there. Hopefully I made a difference to New Zealand. But equally, I moved on at a time of my choosing. It's a, ni it's a really nice position to be in. Just... Uh Two quick questions. What are you most proud of as Prime Minister? Um, two things, I think, really. One was the economic performance. Now, I think you can get into an individual particular policy, but, but ultimately, I reckon most people want to be independent of the state. Um, they want to provide for their own family. They want security, um, and they want to feel as though they've got a confidence about um, their family. And a strong economy lets them do that. You know, it lets them... You know, get over time or get a job or whatever it might be. So for us, I think the economic performances over the last um, decade were really important. I think the other thing was that we really got it right when it came to Christchurch. I think you can always look at individual things, but um, overall, um, there's a reason Christchurch has voted national so strongly post the election. I think there's just a general understanding on the ground there that you know, while not everything is perfect overall, we did a pretty, pretty darn good job. I think we were quite good at responding to those natural disasters, whether they were Kaikoura or, or a Pike River Mine disaster. Anything to worry about with Nikki Hager's book release tonight? It seems to be timed around your valedictory speech, but... Anyway. Well, I think most people would be deeply cynical, wouldn't they, really, that he's going to do, do, a, do a book. I mean, look, Nikki is one of life's great left-wing conspiracy theorists. He sees shadows out of everything, so... I doubt I'll read it. I haven't really bothered reading the others. Um, he'll have some great magical conspiracy, but if you want my view in life, uh, particularly in politics, if it comes to cock up or conspiracy, it's almost always cock up and not conspiracy. Um, so he'll have some fanciful view, but um, it won't it won't prove to be right.